Today we're going to talk about bows. How they're made, although this is not a course in construction, but why they should be made in a certain way. It's been my privilege to get acquainted with the bows of a man considered to be the Stradivari of bow makers, Francois Tourt. He lived in Paris, born 1747, died 1835. He was principally responsible for the development of the French school of violin playing at the Paris Conservatory because his bows were so significant in the development of their technique. To begin with, we have bow blanks, the wood that we use to start the bow. All wood is not equal. Some is much more resonant than others, even from the same species, even in the same tree. When I start to make a bow, I select my wood based upon the resonance that I hear in the wood itself. A way to test that is to find a place where it will vibrate. Quickly hold it to my ear and listen. It's a very beautiful sound. I'm sorry that you probably cannot hear it from there, but come to the shop. We'll do it together. The things I seek are a steady sinusoidal waveform without interfering notes. In other words, a pitch that's pure. I want it to vibrate as long as possible, as loud as possible, die away slowly and always retain that pure tone because the bow can transmit that to the violin. If the bow has no inherent vibratory life, it's just like an Australian boomerang that doesn't come back to you. It's just a stick. We want something that will come back to you or that you will come back to again and again because of its superior playing qualities and the sound that it will help you make on your violin, viola, or cello. An important part of this is that the harmonic spectrum can be maintained without distortion if the wood vibrates as regularly as it can. Hence the reason to select very carefully. Although Pernambuco is now considered an endangered species from Brazil, I think we necessarily have to be very much on the lookout for wood that still remains can be used for bows. I had opportunity to look at 300 pieces of Pernambuco a couple of years ago to select more. And of those 300, I only chose one, and it did not fully reach the criteria that I've just described to you. In the history of bow making, the major change that took place around 1750, 1760. Up to that point, the curvature of the Baroque bow tended to be positive or arced in a convex way, this being the curvature that we now have, which is negative and arced in a concave way. This produced several important differences. Uh, Francois Tourt's father may have been the first to really understand these and introduce them into modern bow making, but it was Francois Tourt who took them to a or perfect place about 1780. His bows, of which this is an example, um, a, a copy of one of his bows, have a nice gently changing curvature from tip to frog. This produced characteristics that were very valuable, still are, but it had one apparent drawback in that players who were becoming more and more um, demonstrative on stage and wanted louder and louder accents from their bows found that the tort bow in the middle 
tended to collapse rather than produce that accent. So they changed the camera. Dominic Picot began experimenting. Later makers like Boran took it to a final degree where the camber was changed so that the center of the bow was much stiffer. This is a bow by Eugene Sartori, who was the last in the long and, and illustrious line of French bow makers who adopted that changed camber. This bow was made about 1930. And if you can see it from the head back, the curvature is very uh, steep, tight radius curve. But about here, and all the way to the back of the frog, it's almost straight. The intense curvature here effectively stiffens the head of the bow, so it does not move. And that allows them to press hard and get a strong attack in the middle of the bow. I think that the tort has an advantage in the shape that it has, and I want to demonstrate what that is. I'm going to tighten the hair a bit. I'm going to show you two ways, one here and then one close to the camera, so you have two chances to see this. If pressure is placed here, as if we're pressing down on the string for a strong accent, you can see a lot of movement at the front of the bow. As you press the back down, the top goes up here, like this, in a, in a very distinct positive curve. I call this the porpoising of the bow because it resembles the behavior of a porpoise in water. It's that extreme. Also, the tip of the bow is moved at the same time. When this goes up, the bow head rotates back and down. This produces a singular advantage in that the hair, even when tight and even when playing a strong uh, forte, does not completely lift up off the string. It continues to hold the string as the head moves back. The hair doesn't become super tight. But the later bow oh, loses that flexibility in order to gain the tension that they saw. Here, if you look, all the pressure that I can apply down here does not translate into a very strong movement of the head or even of the shaft behind the head. Uh, when I come closer, you'll see it again. This means that the hair, when tight, literally rides up onto the top of the string and moves the string only sideways. But if the hair, as in the tort, can hold that string while moving it, it can turn or roll the string back and forth on its axis. And that generates a subharmonic. It's not been well understood, but has recently been identified. That subharmonic warms the entire tone of the instrument. So there's a great advantage emotionally with the impact of the quality of sound that the more flexible bow can achieve. Once again, pressure here. You see the, the rising up of the bow at the front. Sartori can't get a rise out of Sartori. There we go. This is the Tord model bow that I have made. I'm going to look down the length of the shaft. When we get to the head, I will start putting pressure at the frog. If you can see that, it's rotating up and down, porpoising. And this porpoise continues almost to the midpoint. But the beauty of it is how much the head actually bends under. There we are. Now let's look at the sartori. Again, looking closely at it. Try to hold the 
the study for you so you can see the curve. Now, by applying pressure at the frog, great amount of work involved there, but almost no movement on the head itself and almost no purposing. The tension is really high, and yet the center of the bow does not collapse. It resists that, and that's what they were after. Beginning the later bows of Dominique Picot, going through Voran, and up to Sartori, this was the goal. The bows of Francois Tourth, like the violins of Antonio Stradivari, are unique historical objects of great importance as well as great financial value. They perform in ways that modern copies generally do not match. As a consequence, it's important that we retain as much knowledge about them as we can. It's been my purpose to study carefully the bows of Tourt and to make copies that are as accurate as I can make them because whatever we know about them is contained only in the products themselves. We have no records, uh, no written records of how they may have gone about their craft. So this is a copy I've made of a Tourt bow. We've seen this in previous videos. I want to tell you a bit about the process of studying the bow and how I use that to make a copy. I take, in this case, a digital caliper and measure all around the circumference of the bow, every centimeter down the length of it, and keep a close record of those numbers. I then work toward that in making my own bows. I do the same with the measurements of the head and of the frog, where the frog is original in one of their bows one of his bows. The other major piece of information is the camber, the curvature of the bow, in that it is different from modern bows and needs to be traced and understood as well. I've developed a simple method of tracing this camber and I find it to be very, very reliable. Then when I'm making a bow, I can take a tracing of the bow I'm making, compare it like this, several sheets of this tracing paper, to the original Tourt camper and find my way slowly and carefully to as exact a duplicate of his as I can make. I find that that very much influences the behavior of the bow, so accuracy is paramount. Also, in terms of an historic study, this is information that would both guide me if I make a later publication or anyone else who might follow. Once the bow is completed, Tourt did several things which are subtle and generally overlooked by modern makers, but worth remembering. One is, his bows are frequently not quite perfectly round. He tends to make them just a little egg-shaped, somewhat narrower on the top. This creates a lower center of gravity for the bow, which allows it to resist rolling in the hand and gives it a tracking power that an ordinary bow does not match. Subtle, useful, smart. Another thing he does is once he's finished the bow, very carefully cutting the bevel, cutting the nose, getting the shape, getting the measurements, getting the frog right, everything is sharp, very, very sharp with the tools. But that's not where he leaves the bow. Most modern makers are fascinated with the task of being very sharp in their details. 
and they leave the bows that way, not torqued. His are softened, very slightly softened on every sharp edge, bevel, nose, frog, body of the bow. What this does is it resists cracking. If you hit a sharp edge on Pernambuco, which is a fragile material, it's very subject to breaking. By doing the slight rounding, he has achieved two things. One is an insurance policy against cracking and also a very much more beautiful final product. Pleasing, not sharp, not cutting toward the hand or the eye. We should go and do likewise.